أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so today what I wanted to talk about was a topic which rather a term which a lot of us have heard before and that term is poverty but the poverty that I want to talk about today isn't the apparent kind of poverty because before we can begin to talk about any concept we need definitions we need a criterion in speaking about poverty, we need to understand that there's external poverty and there's internal poverty. And one of them is far more dangerous than the other. Because while one type of poverty determines how we live temporarily, the other type of poverty determines how we live eternally. Today I will speak about the latter form, internal poverty is the poverty of the soul. It describes the unmoved soul. The soul that has been created, but still fails to realize the reason why they were created. It's the soul that lives a purposeless life. It's the heart that beats, but has already died. Because while the body cries and bleeds and feels pain from the material world. The soul is untouched by these things because there's only one thing that can cut or stab or impoverish the soul. There's only one thing that can kill it and that is to deprive the soul of its only one true need to be close to its originator, to be near God. Spiritual deprivation is the true impoverishment. True poverty is standing poor on the day of judgment. Despite this reality, we continue to feed our bodies and yet we starve our souls. The sad irony of this is that the body which we focus on is temporary while the soul that we're neglecting is eternal when a body dies we cry but the death of the body isn't true death it's only the removing of a shell and then the movement from one realm into an actual truer and a more real realm we weep when a body departs, but our hearts remain unmoved by those bodies which are alive, but whose hearts and souls have already died because of their alienation from that which gives us life, God. I want to ask you, what impoverishes and kills the heart? The answer is anything that we do that allows the heart to love anything as it should only love God. Because you see, the heart was created with a particular nature and a, for a very particular purpose. When you fail to use any created thing for the very purpose for which it was created, it dies. It breaks. It starves. The heart was created by and for God. The heart was created to know and love God. The heart was created to be given to God to be filled with God. The heart that is given or filled by any other thing suffers the most painful impoverishment and death. 
The human heart is a lot like a boat. If you imagine this boat in the ocean of this dunya, the boat that allows the ocean's water to enter it breaks and then drowns. The human heart that allows this dunya to enter breaks and then drowns and then becomes owned. Owned by this life. Owned by our gadgets, our Facebook, our jobs, our distractions, the fashion trends, the marketing tools, the money, the power, the status. The heart that is owned by this life is a prisoner of the worst kind. The heart that is owned by any other master than the master of masters is the weakest of all slaves. That is true oppression, true death, true poverty. As human beings, we enslave ourselves to different things. Some of us here are enslaved to money. Some of us have enslaved our hearts to other people. We love them as we should only love Allah. Some of us are enslaved to status or to our careers. I tell you to ask yourself, what do you love most? <laughs> most people in this room will say that we love Allah most. We say this with our tongues. We say this in our minds. But our hearts, our actions say otherwise. How do you know what you love most? Ask yourself, what is your refuge? When you're most broken, where do you, where do you turn? When you're afraid, where do you hide? When you need, who do you ask? What do you fear most? What do you stay up at night worrying about? Who, what makes you cry most? What do you think about most? What occupies your mind during Salah? Is it really God? Is it really Allah that is on our minds most? Is it really your fear of standing in front of him that makes you cry in your bed? No, probably not. It's the person who left you, the money you lost, the career you couldn't have, the raise you didn't get. What are you most afraid of? Just the thought of losing what thing causes you so much anxiety that you feel it physically. Is it your husband, your wife, your money, your job? Is it your image? Is it your figure? What is it? When you're given a choice, what do you do? When Allah says to dress and act in a certain way, and then society says otherwise, which do you choose? Who defines beauty for you? Who defines success? When Allah says that interest is haram, but your financial ambitions command otherwise, when society's standards for the size of your house or the kind of car that you drive command otherwise, which do you choose? Who defines richness? Who defines poverty? And what type of poverty are you most afraid of? The truth is that we choose what we love most. When you love money most, that's what you choose. When we love people most, they fill our hearts. We think of them most. Our life loses center. We leave the orbit of the Creator and we enter the orbit of the creation. A painful and unstable orbit. In the orbit of the creation, we rise and fall, 
with the wave of the creation, the wave of praise and criticism. Our standards for success and failure come from the creation, from society. The standard for richness, the standard for poverty comes from the creation, from society. But I think that in teaching Islam, there is a point where we went wrong. I think somewhere along the line, we turned Islam into a list of do's and don'ts, harams and halals. We teach our children about hellfire before they can even pronounce Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. Our Islamic schools become a place to teach you all the things that are haram to do and then all the punishments that will be dealt to you when you do them. When someone converts, the first thing that they're told is that now they need to change their name and stop celebrating Valentine's Day. Somewhere along the line, I think that we started going about Islam from the outside in, instead of from the inside out. But we need to ask ourselves, how did the prophets do it? Peace be upon them all. One of the companions relates that Aisha anha said, if the first thing to be revealed was, do not drink alcoholic drinks, people would have said, we will never give up alcoholic drinks. And if it had been revealed, do not commit illegal sexual intercourse, they would have said, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse. She goes on to explain that the first verses to be revealed were about the Day of Judgment and about Allah. What is our mother Aisha anha, talking about here? She is diagnosing in her wisdom why we have so many Muslims today saying we will never leave alcoholic drinks, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse, we will never give up smoking hookah or pot or pornography. We will never give up dating and all the so-called pleasures associated with it. We refuse to give up these things because we have not yet understood the heart of Islam. For years, we've been bombarded by the self-righteous haram police. But never have we been exposed to the heart police. The Prophet ﷺ taught us why we end up falling into this type of corruption. Why we fall into these types of sins and then refuse to give them up. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which many of us know, truly what is lawful is evident and what is unlawful is evident. And in between the two are matters which are doubtful, which many do not know. He who guards against doubtful things keeps his religion and honor blameless. And he who indulges in doubtful things indulges in fact in unlawful things. Just as a shepherd who pastures his flock around a preserve will soon pasture them in it. Beware, every king has a preserve and the things Allah has declared unlawful are his preserve. But this is the amazing thing. We always stop there when we teach this hadith. But recently, I discovered that the hadith doesn't actually stop there. This hadith begins by talking about staying away from the haram and sticking to the halal. And that's usually where we stop. We are taught that certain things are forbidden. And we are commanded by our teachers and our parents to stay away from them. But the hadith doesn't end there. Yet we end it there. We end it at stay away from the haram and the doubtful matters. Period. But the Prophet ﷺ continues this hadith and tells us how. How can we stay away from the haram and the doubtful matters? How can we protect ourselves from the preserve of Allah? 
And the answer is, it is through islah al rectifying our hearts. The hadith continues and says, إِنَّمَا فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَى إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Beware in the body, there is a lump of flesh. And if that lump of flesh is sound, then the entire body is sound. And if that lump of flesh is corrupted, then the entire body is corrupted, and verily it is the heart. The heart is the master. You see, human beings are all about love. We obey what we love. Whatever fills this lump of flesh called our hearts dictates how we act. And when it comes to love, we make a lot of claims. We claim to love a lot of things. But like the great poet said, love is like a lawsuit. It requires evidence. I ask you, what is the evidence of love? What is the direct consequence of this powerful emotion. I want you to think for a moment about human love. What happens when someone is in love with another person? That person will desire nothing more than to serve, please, and be close to the one they love. And this service is not motivated by begrudging obligation, but rather by a deep inner drive born directly out of that love. Because you see, love speaks for itself. When you love someone, you do what pleases them. And your greatest joy is in pleasing and serving the one you love. It is an honor to serve the one you love. Imagine when someone is in the presence of a famous person. Imagine that you're crossing the street and you come across, for example, Will Smith. How do people act when they come across someone like Will Smith? Typically, the way they act is, can I get you something? A glass of water? Can I tie your shoe? <laughs> and then, of course, they go back home and boast to everyone that they got to tie Will Smith's shoe. <laughs> Now, you may not care about Will Smith, but you understand the point here. There is an honor in serving the one you love. There is tashrif. And it is only once that love is gone or weakened that serving that person goes from being an honor to just being a burden. It goes from tashrif to only taklif. Sadly, our worship of Allah, our worship of God is like this, just a burden. We don't pray to seek refuge from the storm of our lives. If we pray at all, we do it to get it out of the way. Or maybe because there's someone who won't stop nagging us until we do. Somehow we have forgotten that if we don't pray, we harm no one, not Allah, not our mothers, not our fathers. We harm only our own selves. You see, on the day of judgment, every man and woman will stand alone in front of Allah. And there is nothing that anyone can do for you except by the permission of Allah. On that day, a mother will be willing to throw away her own child just to save herself. Please understand the reality that we have forsaken because we are so caught up with our money, our phones, our apps, our friends, our parties, our highs. We're so caught up with the cute guys and the pretty girls. Please understand that ignoring a reality does not make it any less real. It is still going to happen. Being unprepared for something doesn't stop it from happening. If, for example, you choose to stay up all night instead of studying for a final exam, 
It doesn't mean that your final won't happen. It still will, and you only end up failing. If we spend this life just partying, pretending that the final exam isn't coming, it won't stop it from happening. Nothing will stop death. Nothing. Nothing will delay the day of judgment. Like that final exam, the question is only, are we prepared? Or are we too busy playing? Imagine for a moment that the news forecasts that a huge storm is coming. And you guys can relate to this. This happened. You were told that a huge storm was coming. But imagine that we're told that if we don't seek shelter, we and our families will be destroyed. What would we do? What did we do when we were told that a huge storm was coming? If we really believed that the storm was coming, we would run to shelter, right? Only a person who didn't believe the forecast would continue playing and ignoring the countless warnings only if you thought it was a lie, only if you didn't really believe. But let me ask you this, how could we know, really know that a storm was about to hit and do absolutely nothing to protect ourselves and our families? Would anyone say, I'm actually a little too busy hanging out right now? I'm too busy on my phone or on Facebook or making money to run to shelter. I'd rather check out this person's profile than protect myself from the storm. No one says that. And yet every single time we put off our prayers, put off wearing hijab, put off giving up dating, put off leaving our poisonous bad company, put off abandoning alcohol or pornography or pot, that's exactly what we're saying. The fact that we cannot leave these haram things, the fact that we insist, I will never leave alcoholic drinks, I will never give up illegal sexual intercourse, I will never give up smoking hookah or pot or pornography, I will never give up dating and all the so-called pleasures associated with it. The fact that our worship has become just a burden is a sign that there is a problem internally. There is a problem with our sight. We don't really see the storm coming. We don't really see the Day of Judgment. We haven't purified and rectified the lump of flesh that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. And as a result, the rest of our bodies, the rest of our actions, the rest of our lives have become corrupted. We don't really see Allah with our hearts. And we haven't built our love for Him. We haven't really used our heart for the very purpose for which it was created. To know, to serve, and to love God. Remember that the first verses to be revealed were not about haram and halal. They were not about dating or drinking or smoking or pot. They were about the fact that as a matter of certainty, just as certain as I'm standing in front of you today, that you and I will meet our Maker. You and I will stand in front of Allah and we will be asked, what did you love most? What did you spend your life chasing? What did you spend your life running after? Will it last? The things that you chase, will they last? Will they help you or will they hurt you? once the illusion of this life has passed. 
we need to come back to Allah before it's too late. And often what keeps people from coming back to Allah is that they believe that their sins are too great for Him to forgive. But to this thought, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. And He says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say, O oh my servants, who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is He who is the forgiving, the merciful. But how do we avoid true impoverishment of the soul? No one likes to fall. And few people would ever choose to drown in the ocean of dunya. But in struggling through that ocean, sometimes it is so hard not to let the world in. Sometimes the ocean does enter us. The ocean, the dunya does seep into our hearts. And like the water that breaks the boat, when dunya enters, it shatters our hearts. It shatters the boat. If you allow dunya to own your heart, you will sink to the depth of the sea. And you will feel as though you are at your lowest point, entrapped by your sins and the love of this life. You may feel completely broken, surrounded by darkness. <coughs> That's the amazing thing about the floor of the ocean. No light enters it. But that dark place is not the end. Remember that the darkness of the night precedes the dawn. And as long as your heart still beats, this is not the death of it. You don't have to die here. Sometimes the ocean floor is only just a stop in the journey. And it is when you are at your lowest point that you are faced with a choice. You can stay there at the bottom until you drown, or you can gather pearls and rise back up, stronger from the swim and richer from the jewels. If you seek him, God can raise you up and replace the darkness of the ocean with the light of His Son. He can transform what was once your greatest weakness into your greatest strength, and a means of growth, purification, and redemption. Know that transformation sometimes begins with a fall. So never curse the fall. The ground is where humility lives. Take it in, learn it, and then come back stronger, humbler, and more aware of your need for Him. Come back having seen your own nothingness and His greatness. Know that if you have seen that reality, then you have seen a lot. For the one who is truly deceived is the one who only sees his own self but not his creator. Deprived is the one who has never really witnessed his own desperate need for God. Reliant on his own means, he forgets that the means, his own soul, and everything else in existence is his creation. Seek Allah to bring you back. Because when he does, he will rebuild your ship. The heart that you thought was forever damaged will be mended. What was shattered will be whole again. Know that only Allah can do this. So seek him. And when he saves you, beg forgiveness for the fall. Feel remorse over it, but don't despair.
As Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, Shaytan rejoiced when Adam alayhi salam came out of paradise. But he did not know that when a diver sinks into the sea, he collects pearls and then rises again. There is a powerful and amazing thing about Kelba, repentance, and turning back to Allah. We are told that it is a polish for the heart. What's amazing about a polish is that it doesn't just clean. A polish makes the object even more beautiful, even shinier than it was before it got dirty. <laughs> if you come back to God, seek His forgiveness and refocus your life and heart on Him, you have the potential to be even richer than if you had never fallen at all. Sometimes falling and coming back gives you wisdom and humility that you may never otherwise have had. The Prophet ﷺ defines richness for us. He says that richness is not having many possessions. Rather, true richness is the richness of the soul. But how can we fill our hearts with true richness? How do we escape the constant bombardment from every direction, commanding us to worship other things, commanding us to take idols of the heart and love them as we should only love Allah? How do we escape the true poverty of allowing any competitor into our hearts? How do we escape the poverty of enslaving ourselves to another deity as Allah warns us in the Quran. There are people who take for worship others besides Allah as equal with Him. They love them as they should only love Allah. But those of faith are overflowing in their love for Allah. In order to escape true poverty, we must be overflowing in our love for Allah. Ashaddu hubban lillah. Your strongest love should be for God. But you can't love someone that you don't know. We need to know him. And you don't love and you don't know someone that you never speak to. Speak to him. Ask of him. And you can't love someone that you never remember. Remember him. Remember him often. So this is actually a call to all of those people who have become enslaved by the tyranny of the self and imprisoned in the dungeon of the nefs and desires. It's a call to all those who have entered the ocean of dunya and who have sunk down and become entrapped by its crushing wave. Rise up rise up to the air, to the real world, above the prison of the ocean. Rise up to your freedom, rise up and come back to life. Leave the death of your soul behind you. Your heart can still live and be stronger and purer than it ever was. Remember that the polish of Tawbah, repentance, makes the heart even more beautiful than it was. Remove the veil that you have sown with your sins. Remove the veil between you and life, between you and freedom, between you and light, between you and God. Remove that veil and rise up. <coughs> Come back to yourself before it's too late. Allah tells us, Allah 
and return to your Lord and submit to him before the punishment comes upon you, then you will not be helped. Brothers and sisters, the storm is coming. Seek refuge in the only place that refuge exists. Seek refuge in Allah. You and I know what day we were born. But none of us in this room know what day we will die. And many people think that we can live our lives however we want. And then at the time of death, just say, La ilaha illallah. But at the time of death, the tongue cannot speak except what the heart commands. Whatever is in the heart will come out at the time of death. The impoverished heart will have nothing but love of dunya to speak about on that day. If our heart is empty of Allah during our life, how is it going to be full of Allah during our death? If our heart is full of love of this life, love of status, love of wealth, love of the creation over the creator, it is that which will speak at the time of death. If the heart was full of grudges, jealousy, hatred, that will speak at the time of death. But if it was full of the love of Allah, that will speak. If in your life, your heart carried only la ilaha illallah, that truly there is no refuge, no shelter, no deity worthy of worship but Him. Then and only then will the tongue be given permission to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Allahumma ja'anna minhum, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.